Hi, everybody. I'm Marla Andrews, a humane educator and founder of Humane Hearts, and I'd like to welcome you all to this ninth session of the Compassion Arts Festival for 2021, entitled Lift Up All Who Care, a reflection on the ninth tenet, praise and help those who work with animals and the natural world. The program will look at some of the ways we can help animals directly, but mostly we but mostly how we help animals by lifting up the work of others and in the choices we make, how we treat each other and how we care for ourselves. The event will include a short spotlight on the work of Rivers with Wish Sanctuary to start the program, followed by photographer and animal advocate, Isa Leshko, and then an interview with Cyrus Mejia, artist and co-founder of Best Friends Animal Society. Lastly, we will be joined by Lisa Levinson of In Defense of Animal Sustainable Activism Campaign for an informal panel on compassion fatigue and what we can all do. Working in animal, well or working in animal welfare can be tough going. The hours are long, vacations are few to none, the job can be physically and emotionally demanding, and the pay well enough said. There are often issues with finding and keeping good reliable staff. So it begs the question, why do we choose to work with animals and for animal causes? Of course, there are many reasons why we do, mainly to help end animal suffering. Some of us are innately drawn to animals. We feel a connection and we feel deeply wanting to help these creatures who share our planet, wanting to give voice to the voiceless. Some of us are drawn toward animals because we are not people persons. We may relate more to animals because they offer us the unconditional companionship and love that is harder to come by in the more complicated world of people. And some of us are drawn to animals and people. We want to simply make the world a kinder and more gentler place for everyone. To those on the outside, even if they cannot relate to our love for animals, they see that we are following our passions and they may think, doesn't following your passion for animals make the emotional and physical burdens worth it? So what do we mean by lifting up those who care and why should we bother? After all, aren't the quote animal people supposed to do all of the work, the activism and the advocacy for animals? So the rest of us don't have to. Well, the answer is um, no. We all have a moral responsibility to help those in need, both human and animal, and not turn a blind eye. However, the truth is that much work is done by a small group of dedicated people who need to get something back from their work, as well as relief from the anguish of many knowing that they can't save them all. 20 years ago, when we would discuss mental health and stability in animal caregivers, compassion fatigue was a novel topic. The cost of caring or burnout that was only used with regards to first responders, medical professionals, and other human-related caregiving is now an accepted part of our lexicon when discussing animal caregiving, animal caregivers. We have progressed in that recognition and can offer not only help with dealing with the mental health burdens of working with animals, but can also offer a proactive plans to produce and build resiliency in individuals so that animal caregivers can remain more healthy from the get-go, hence retaining the army of solid caregivers. Part of that resiliency training, if you will, revolves around support and praise for those who work with animals. But praise and help must also be available for those of us who care so deeply for animals, but for a variety of reasons, don't work directly with them. Each one of us who believes that all sentient beings should exist in the world free from pain and suffering can also benefit from being helped and guided along on our journeys. Some of us work in unrelated fields, but feel no less dedicated to the causes of animals. We can be laborers or lawyers, medical doctors or mechanics, mothers or teachers. When we care deeply, we too can suffer. In fact, I would even suggest that because some, um, some deeply caring people work outside the world of animal welfare, there could be more personal suffering and that they feel they aren't doing quite enough. But we all do what we can do, and yet we can all do better. However, animal advocates 
can be our own worst enemies at times. Sometimes instead of lifting each other up, we point blame for not doing enough. But there is power in numbers. We attract more flies with honey, right? I mean, vegan honey. But the point is we need to be kinder to each other, sympathize and empathize with each other, applaud what we are actually doing well or what we are just trying to do and booing along those that have less resilience or energy. We need to carry each other on our collective backs when needed. And animal advocacy and act activism needs to start at home with advocating and helping for each other. A little bit about me. Again, my name is Marla Andrews. I've experienced firsthand the many challenges of what working with animals can look like. Since I was very young, I felt a calling to work with animals that I suppose is not unlike those, are, those who are called to the clergy. Animal welfare has defined much of who I am. When I was very young, I wrote letters demanding changes from governments that supported the killing of baby harp seals. I participated in anti-fur boycott campaigns. At veterinary hospitals where I worked in high school, I witnessed euthanasia of trailers full of losing racetrack greyhound dogs. I work with seal pup rescue and specific dog breed rescues. I actively campaign for legislation to protect animals used in testing products for meat, dairy, and egg production for spaying and neutering campaigns and against trapping for any animal products, including furs. My advocacy and activism led me to the MSPCA for many years where I found my love and calling in humane education. I found a name for that calling and a medium in which I could facilitate change by channeling my love for both animals and people. I spent many years going into schools, homes for troubled youth, corporations, elderly housing, and more, teaching about the importance of being kind to animals and each other by cultivating empathy and acceptance. But throughout my life's work, I would ebb and flow with the mental challenges of feeling so deeply, and at times not being able to shut off the caring and compassion. There were nightmares and sleepless nights, general fatigue, a growing numbness as to the effectiveness of my work or the lack of dedication in others. In spite of all of my hard work and efforts of so many others, there were still countless stories of cruelty in the world. I soon learned that these complex emotions or feelings I was experiencing had a name and it was called compassion fatigue or burnout in animal caregivers. It was just a subject not spoken much about nor treated. After all, we were just working with animals, right? We weren't saving people or the world through the eyes of much of society. But animal caregivers surely suffer as much, if not more, in a world where their professions aren't necessarily revered or supported like those of human caregivers. That lack of support is what I would ultimately contribute to caring and compassionate people leaving the field of animal welfare. But years later, now we know that that help is available and much can be done to keep us all healthier and happier doing what we do, caring as much as we do care and being out there in a world where we can facilitate changes to help protect and support animals and people alike. I was able to incorporate my concern for healthier caregivers and those who simply care deeply into compassion fatigue workshops and mentoring sessions. Most recently, in conjunction with my consulting as a humane educator, pet loss, grief counselor, and vegan lifestyle coach, I have found ways to make inroads into feeling fulfilled with my work for animals and for people. This allows me to help others who help animals. So we're going to move to the program now the short video from Rivers Wish Sanctuary co-founders, um, Kit and Pete Chagoda. We'll show the video first and then I'll tell you a little bit more about it.
What a lovely place. Rivers Wish Sanctuary is 100% volunteer run refuge for animals who have been neglected, abused or forgotten. Located on 65 acres in Northwest Spokane, Washington, the sanctuary cares for rabbits, horses, cows, donkeys, sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese, pigs, dogs, cats, and sometimes other animals who find their way to the sanctuary. There are so many sanctuaries that we would love to share about here, but the reason we're telling you a little bit about River's Wish today is because of the story of River's Wish is a powerful and, and inspiring example of how everyday people can be making a huge difference in the lives of animals and in the lives of those helping them. The sanctuary founders, Pitt, Kit and Pete Jacoda are both artists and educators. They have been art teachers for over 30 years. They created their amazing sanctuary in tribute to and in spirit of their beloved dog, River, who was once a shelter dog and whose love encouraged them to do more. They didn't intend to be sanctuary founders, but after joining a local pet rescue group, their eyes were open to the plight of animals in need and the suffering of animals. So they began fostering animals and then expanding their work over time until they eventually decided to become a sanctuary. Since then, they have rescued, fostered, and placed hundreds of dogs, cats, rabbits, goats, horses, and other animals, as well as also providing for those who cannot be adopted a safe and forever home of love and care. The other reason we wanted to highlight the work of River's Wish is because of the ways they integrate the visual arts and creative writing into the sanctuary's humane education programs, offering art workshops and retreats to provide the tools, skills, and inspiration for helping people find creative expression as a voice for other animals and to help lift up others to expand their circles of compassion. We'll show you one more river, one more video of River's Wish Sanctuary here so that we can move to our other amazing presenters, but we hope you will check out their work and their website at riverswishsanctuary.org. I believe we had um, a video coming in. From Kit Chakota. I know it already, uh, it already showed. Okay. So is, yeah, that was it, sorry. <laughs> okay, I thought she was going to speak, I'm sorry. Um, I guess we can move on to part two of our, um, of our program of um, lifting up all who care. Um, part two is using our work to help lift up those who help animals. And that can happen in many different ways, but we're going to talk first about um, the work of somebody that I'm honored, most honored to introduce, is Aleshko, the highly revered photographic artist and writer whose work examines themes relating to animal rights, aging, and mortality. She's received multiple notable artistic fellowships and has exhibited her work widely in the US. Her images have been published around the globe, including the Atlantic, the Boston Globe, The Guardian, and Harper's Magazine. She's the author of Allowed to Grow Old, Portraits of Elderly Animals from Farm Sanctuaries, published by the University of Chicago Press. The book is comprised of intimate portraits and stories featuring elderly rescued farm animals allowed to live out their lives on sanctuaries with love, compassion, and kindness. Iza's work is nothing less than monumentally original and transformative in both its focus and scope. 
BuzzFeed News writes, for each picture, Leshko's approach her Leshko approaches her subjects with the same dignity that she would a human being, taking the time to get to understand each of the animal's mannerisms and unique personalities. Since most of these rescues come from places of extreme cruelty, such as slaughterhouses and factory farms, Leshko's special care and patience is crucial to building trust between animal and artist. And Peter Singer states, Leshko's remarkable unsentimental photos of older chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, and other animals achieve something that I have not seen before in photos of domesticated animals. We get to know them not as things to eat or produce milk or eggs for us, but as individuals with personalities and lives of their own to lead. The book, which is now in its second printing, was selected by BuzzFeed as one of the best photography books of 2019 and was a coffee table book recommendation of the New York Times in 2019 holiday gift guide. A Korean translation of Allowed to Grow Old will be released in 2022. I offer a warm welcome to you, Izaleshko. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I am honored to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Marla. And I also want to thank Ellie Sarti and the Compassion Arts Festival team for producing this incredible uh, week of programming. Um, and um, tonight, what I want to do is read a story of one of the animals that I met and photographed um, while making Allowed to Grow Old. And um, I want to also send some love to uh, the Culture and Animals Foundation because um, they actually funded my trip to Posado Safe Haven where Babs, who we're going to hear about, lived. Um, so, um, I, I also want to express my gratitude to the Culture and Animal Foundation um, for their support for this work. So um, here, uh, let's go to the next slide. Can we go to the next? Oh, yes, thank you. So that is a portrait of Babs and I'm going to read her story. The moment I saw Babs's brown, unruly fur, I thought of my favorite Sesame Street character from childhood, Mr. Snuffleupagus. Then I looked into her soulful eyes and all comparisons to Snuffy abruptly halted. The old donkey's eyes had a weariness that suggested she had endured trauma at some point in her life. Next slide, please. During the first 17 years of her life, Babs had been used for roping practice on a ranch in Eastern Washington. Donkeys are inexpensive, so cattle ranchers often learn roping techniques on them instead of on mechanical dummies. Many rodeos also use donkeys for entry level roping competitions. Roping involves electrically shocking a donkey to make her run chasing her on horseback, and then tossing a lasso around her neck or rear legs to pull her to the ground. Donkeys endure this practice repeatedly until they are exhausted, maimed, or killed. When Babs arrived at Posado Safe Haven in Sultan, Washington, she was covered in rope burns. She also suffered from equine Cushing's disease, a pituitary disorder that causes insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. She was placed on a restricted diet of hay that had been soaked in water to reduce the sugar content. Whenever she was out of her stall, she had to wear a muzzle that prevented her from grazing on grass. Babs also arrived at the sanctuary with chronic laminitis, a painful inflammation of tissues, the laminae, in equine hooves that leads to lameness. Her condition was too severe to cure, but Posado's animal care workers mis managed her pain with twice daily ice baths, massage, and acupuncture. She also wore orthotic boots throughout the day. 
Despite her history of abuse, Babs trusted her caregivers and tolerated the foot treatments. She was no pushover though, and was never shy about expressing her displeasure. If her meals were even a few minutes late, she would bray loudly until the food came. She enjoyed massages, but snapped at anyone who tried to brush her. Eventually she relented and permitted the grooming, but immediately afterward, she would roll around in her stall's wood shavings in protest. She was perpetually covered with wood chips and staff referred to them as her sparkles. Babs was closest to a blind Shet old Shetland pony named Peach Pie, who had been rescued from a hoarder. Although Babs could be quite domineering with other animals at the sanctuary, she was gentle with Peach. Soon they began spent, soon they spent all their waking hours together. Like any close companions, the two would occasionally quarrel. During these arguments, Babs would kick her hind legs up in the air, but because of her orthopedic issues, she could only lift her hooves off the ground by at most a foot. Peach would respond by half-heartedly biting the air. After a few minutes of fighting, the two would consider the matter settled and resume enjoying each other's company. Babs was younger than Peach, and when he died, caregivers tried to pair her with a goat named Ethel. Although Babs was receptive to the new friendship, the goat was terrified of her and ran away whenever she came near. Fortunately, a pair of young miniature donkeys named Jacques and Olé arrived at the sanctuary. Despite her age, Babs went into heat upon meeting the teenage boys and the sanctuary staff jokingly called her a cougar. Although the boys had been neutered and were considerably shorter than Babs, they still tried mounting her. They were separated from Babs until her heat period ended. When they were reintroduced, a platonic friendship blossomed. The trio often got into trouble, especially after they figured out how to open the gate to their pasture. Sanctuary staff did not mind their antics though, because they were delighted to see Babs so happy. Later, as her health deteriorated, Jacques and Olé remained close by her, even when she required stall rest. A year after I had photographed Babs, I returned to Posado Safe Haven on my final trip for this project. When I saw my old friend, I hugged her and buried my face in her fleecy cheek. I was told that Babs had survived a rough winter, but would likely not see another one. On that day though, she seemed robust and cheerful. I watched as she devoured her supper and afterward I picked sparkles from her fur. Her nose was as velvety as I remembered. The following month, Babs' laminitis worsened considerably. Her caregivers and veterinarian decided it was time to end her suffering. On her last day, Babs was fed delicacies that had previously been off limits because of her Cushing's disease. She ate strawberries, peaches, watermelon, ginger snaps, peppermints, crackers, and apple pie. Staff and volunteers visited her throughout the afternoon to shower her with love. Reinvigorated by their attention, she rolled on the ground with joy and miraculously righted herself without assistance. Her passing was quick and serene. For weeks after her death, Babs' stall was left untouched. Her boots were arranged in a corner with her blanket and her grazing muzzle hung on the wall. Mourners left roses and sunflowers on the ground where Babs had slept. A few months later, a traumatized llama named Phyllis moved into Babs' stall. She had been horribly neglected by three separate owners and was understandably terrified of humans. Although her caregivers have their work cut out for them, 
Their memories of Babs sustain their hope that one day Phyllis too will find peace. So I, I picked that story uh, to highlight uh, Posado's safe haven uh, sanctuary that is very dear to me. Um, and I wanna share a few images that I created during my last visit to Posado's. Next slide, please. This is the sign that greets visitors entering the sanctuary. It reads, sweet creatures who pass this way once, scared and alone, now you are safe, now you are home. I wept when I first saw the sign. It beautifully encapsulates exactly what makes sanctuaries so special. One of the many things that farm sanctuaries, uh, one of the many things that farm sanctuaries do that, are, that is so special and important is the care that they provide to animals at the time of their deaths and also how they honor the memories of these animals after they died. Babs's story illustrates this well. Babs was lavished with love and treats on her final day. She was surrounded by her dearest friends during her final moments. Sanctuary staff and visitors left flowers at her stall for weeks after her death. This is incredibly powerful when you consider the billions of land animals who are brutally murdered each year whose corpses are either discarded as trash or commodified. Ensuring that a rescued farm animal dies with dignity and is remembered lovingly is nothing short of a transgressive act. It is important to remember that sanctuary staff form incredibly close bonds with the animals in their care. Their grief for these animals, particularly ones they have loved for years, is no different than the grief we have when a beloved companion animal dies. An important part of their healing process is to commemorate the lives of these animals. Often on social media, sanctuaries will post obituaries for recently deceased animals. One thing all of us can do to support sanctuary staff is to respond with love and care to these posts and or make a donation in honor of the deceased. If you personally know someone who works at a sanctuary, reach out to them and send them love. Many sanctuaries also have physical memorial spaces that honor residents who have passed away. Posado Safe Haven's Memorial Garden is very special. And here are a few images from my visit there. Next slide, please. Some of the stones in this garden are quite poignant. This image shows a moving tribute to two cows. Bessie on the left, her, her stone reads, forever a loving mom and the strongest lady we know. Next to her stone is baby stone, which reads, magnificent giant, indelibly gentle until we meet again. Other stones in the Posados Memorial Garden are funny. Next slide, please. Here we have a stone honoring Nora Pig, which reads, lived her life full of sass, knocked her vet on her derriere, let's say. Sanctuary staff know they cannot possibly rescue all of the animals in need. That's not why they exist. Nonetheless, this knowledge is painful to many who dedicate their lives to caring for the lucky few who have reached sanctuaries. At Posados, there is a memorial stone honoring animals who will never reach their gates. Next slide, please. It reads, in remembrance of all the individual animals who have perished outside of our gates as a result of food production, cruelty and neglect, animal testing, quote unquote, entertainment. You too are in our hearts. May you finally be free of your fear, pain and suffering. So in closing, I encourage everyone watching this program to support farm sanctuaries, which you can do in a number of ways. In my book, there is a list of the sanctuaries I visited. 
while working on my project. I also list the sanctuaries on my website. If you go to the project info section under allowed to grow old, you'll see the list. I include links to their website so you can easily visit them. Follow these sanctuaries on social media, sign up for their newsletters. And if you're financially able to do so, please donate to them. The last few years have been incredibly difficult on us all, but especially for nonprofits like sanctuaries who depend on event programming for revenue. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. That's beautiful. Your project ended up not only shining a light on each individual animal and the millions unable to be saved, but also likely lifting up the world of animal sanctuary caregivers in that they received outside validation from a world looking in on an often overlooked and difficult world of saving, caring for, and loving animals. As we know, it can be an emotional and physically taxing world with many obstacles, but with the world looking in through your lens, there's more reason for hope and change for the betterment of all farm animals. So thank you for your time today. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next guest and I'm most humbled and honored to introduce this next guest, Cyrus Mejia. Growing up in a richly cross-cultural household, Cyrus studied painting, drawing, and ceramics in Mississippi before traveling abroad, spending several years in Europe. A chance encounter with dogs caged in a London research laboratory turned his sights in a new direction. No longer could Mejia practice his art without incorporating this indelible experience. He says, I was so shocked and moved by what I saw that I had no choice but to try and help animals in any way that I could. His way would incorporate art and subsequently much more. In 1984, Mejia and his wife, Anne, were among a dedicated group of animal-loving friends who founded Best Friends Animal Society. Mejia's artwork reflects his passion for animals and the earth and can be found in both private and public collections. He is also the co-founder of Raven's Heart Gallery, a gallery dedicated to presenting artwork that expresses compassion, kindness, and respect for all life. Best Friends Animal Society is a leading national animal welfare organization dedicated to ending the killing of animals in America's companion, in America's shelters. A leader in the no-kill movement, Best Friends runs the nation's largest no-kill sanctuary for companion animals, as well as a life-saving program in collaboration with its nationwide network members and partners working to save them all. Welcome, Cyrus Mejia. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. And You're very thank welcome. And thanks to everyone who's made this possible. It's uh, such an honor to, to be here and be a part of this um, festival. And um, I just appreciate being here. Thank you. Okay, we have a few questions for you. If you don't mind, we'd like to pick that brain of yours and find out what's <laughs> made you who you are. This program is on the Ninth Trust, which is praise and help those who work with animals and the natural world. We'd like to talk to you about how you do this in your life and work, um, both as an artist and gallery co-founder and as a co-founder of Best Friends Animal Society. Can you share a little about your work in these areas and how it not only helps animals directly, but also helps support and lift up others who care about animals as well? I feel so blessed to be where I am in relation to best friends now and the employ our employees especially. But I've done everything from, since the beginning of best friends. I was involved in helping to build the place and working with animals and creating the uh, visitors experience for uh, our welcome center when visitors come here. But now I work in our human resources and talent department and. Um, my focus and my people I work with are focused on 
helping to make best friends the best place ever to work. And that's really important because taking care of the people who care for animals has always been a passion of mine. And it's really important because we in the animal welfare business can become overwhelmed quite often. So I think it's so important to give people a chance. We have a lot of uh, uh, self-care things. A lot of this started during the pandemic period when nobody was going out very much and all of our meetings and things were on Zoom and wasn't a lot of interpersonal contact with our employees. So a lot of this has been developed over the last couple of years. Um, but we are trying to elevate our employees to the level where they can feel that self-respect and appreciation of the work that we all do. Um, so one of the things that I do in relation to that is I teach uh, meditation classes. Uh, I have a meditation group for our employees every week, uh, once a week. And for me, that's a, a really important part of my life. And it's an important part I think I can hope I can share with other people to help them to be more here in the moment uh, in our in the world where we're caring for others, whether it's animals or people, uh, we're often overwhelmed by the, the suffering and the pain that the other being is feeling. And through meditation, we can learn to step back just a little bit from that, uh, step back from our feelings and our thoughts and realize that we don't have to follow every single thought down a rabbit hole. Have you received good sure. feedback on that from your I'm people sorry? that work? Have you received feedback from the people that, that have started meditating? Yes, absolutely. Uh, people, people find it very helpful. I, have, I don't know whether I've actually answered your first question or whether I've gone off track. I just, I just asked, uh, yes, it, how it helps animals. Can you share a little bit about your work in these areas and how it not only helps animals directly, but also helps support and lift others up about well, animals one thing as well? I, one thing I, I neglected to mention was, of course, my artwork, mm -hmm. as well as being a founder of Best Friends. I'm an artist. And uh, my, I've always tried to create art that is uplifting which is in some ways difficult in this field because a lot of my art has had to do with animal issues and issues of animal welfare and suffering. So some years ago, I created a large collection of um, installation pieces that were based on the numbers of animals that were being killed in shelters at that time. This started in the year 2000. And at that time I had read that uh, 17 million animals had died in shelters that previous year. And I didn't even know how many animals that, I didn't know how big that number was. So I couldn't count that high, <laughs> 17 million, what is that? So I figured I would divide that up and uh, create artwork about a smaller number. So if I divided it up in how many animals are dying every hour, that came up to be 575. So this was called the 575 Project. And I created artwork from collections of objects that I collected from shelters to represent that number of animals. So I had dog collars, dog tags, uh, intake forms from shelters and things like that. And the to answer your question, to going back to your question, the one important thing that I had to had to relate to on this was this is a horrible number I'm talking about. It's a horrible fact that this many animals are dying. How do I convey that to people in a way that isn't just hitting them over the head with this ugly fact? And so I had to put that, I figured to put the message a couple of layers behind in the piece of art. So for example, one of my pieces was um, 
a full-size dog house made out of wood that was completely covered with dog collars collected from animals from shelters. And most of those dogs that I got the collars for had probably been killed. But when you look at it from a distance, it's just a multicolored dog house shape. And you get a little closer and you see there's straps, there are these collars going all around it. And when you get even closer, you read the little card that described what this piece was about. And you look inside the, the dog house and you see there was a tennis ball in there. And then people would break into tears because they would it's get incredibly it. moving, incredibly moving. Hmm. Wow. Uh, in what ways are the animals themselves part of lifting up those who care? And I think part of what you're saying um, is through your art and, and inspiration for your art, I'm guessing, and sharing those images that you're um, in art that you're creating. Yes, that and also the fact that they can teach us so much about life. The animals are here now in the present moment all the time. I've never seen a dog sitting and worrying about whether somebody else liked them or not. You know, I never, I've never met a cat that was concerned about the future or the past. They're here and now. And if we can look into the eyes of an animal, a dog, a cat, a cow, a pig, a horse, a bird, anybody, um, you, you see really the eyes of God, you see the present moment. And uh, that to me is so inspiring. Yes, how inspirational is that? Thank you. I have one last question. You've been an animal advocate and an artist of animals and nature for decades, but many people who care about animals feel that they're not able to help directly or feel that they, there are too many areas of need um, to choose from. What are some of the ways everyday people who are not advocates can help those who work with animals and the natural world? Well, of course, I, I, um, Issa mentioned this earlier that all of these organizations that are doing this, and there are thousands and thousands of us out there, um, are run by passionate people and supported by donations. So one of the important things that people can do is give contributions. Mm -hmm. But you can also volunteer, you can visit on, on the sign. I think you showed a photograph of the sign at the beginning, at the entrance to Best Friends Sanctuary here in Utah. And it's a big sign says Best Friends Animal Sanctuary. And it says at the bottom, visit, volunteer, adopt. So those are three things that people can do. They can visit the shelters, they can visit these places that they are, uh, they want to support, uh, they can volunteer there, and they, and if it's a shelter uh, that takes in animals that are for adoption, they can adopt an animal. So donate, visit, volunteer, adopt. And probably, and probably a nice thank you once in a while too, you know, for all those people that are doing all that um, scooping and heavy lifting and day to day, that's probably um, um, an appreciated um, couple of kind words for them as well. So yes, thank you absolutely. for that. Yeah. I know you'll join us in a few minutes for our round table, but thank you, Cyrus. Thank you. So the last segment of our program looks at compassion fatigue and how we can better understand um, what that is all about and um, help to lift up all who care about animals in the natural world in their work as well as ours. We'll also talk a bit about how everyday people who are not animal advocates or who aren't able to create a sanctuary can learn ways of dealing with feelings of powerfulness, powerlessness, I apologize, powerlessness and helplessness in the face of animal suffering so that people can feel empowered to take action where they can, um, where they can help animals and move forward in hope. Um, so first I'd like to introduce our last but not least panelist, who's a familiar face to those of us in Compassion Arts, Lisa Levinson. Lisa is the Director of Defense of Animal Sustainable Activism Campaign, which offers emotional and spiritual support for animal activists via a helpline, support groups, and online events. 
She has worked extensively developing and coordinating programs that offer information and support for understanding and preventing compassion fatigue for people working with animals in rescue and caregiving, as well as for people in animal advocacy and vegan outreach, um, excuse me, who are working to raise awareness about animals and veganism and creating positive, peaceful change. Lisa is a co-founder of Vegan Spirituality and organizes groups and retreats to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. She's an artist and co-founder of Public Eye, Artists for Animals, which works to teach compassion for animals through the arts. She's also founded Toad Detour to help migrating toads safely cross the road in Philadelphia. She's no stranger to Compassion Arts, having hosted and participated in many events. Welcome back, Lisa Levinson. Hello, <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. This is such an inspiring program. I've really enjoyed hearing from Cyrus and Issa, so great. <laughs> it's our, our pleasure to have you again. We were just wondering if you might wanna share a few um, things that you've been up to and what you've been dealing with with regards to, um, to some of these topics. Oh, sure. Well, so um, I, as the director of the Sustainable Activism Campaign for In Defense of Animals, we have really put together a lot of spiritual and emotional resources for animal activists. We have an online activist resource list that, that anyone can um, check out and find all kinds of helpful tools. And you can access that by going to idausa.org forward slash resources and then there's all kinds of blogs and we even have an events page there we've been doing webinars for several years on sustainable activism featuring people just like you have today who talk about uh, compassion fatigue and ways that we can overcome that so it's been really a delight to host these programs that are educational for animal activists animal um, caretakers of all kinds so that they can understand a little bit more about what happens when we are taking care of animals and also may experience burnout or compassion fatigue. So that's you, some of what I've been up to. You are a pretty busy woman, I will say that. <laughs> if we want to bring Cyrus back in, we can talk um, a little bit in our roundtable section. Um, we want to reflect upon um, lifting up all who care um, and through the lenses of how compassion fatigue can impact the way people helping animals treat each other and treat themselves. It's a vital part of helping animals and a part of why some advocates and caregivers sometimes experience the burnout. Um, what are some of the signs of compassion fatigue and advocacy and why do you think it's important to address? And we'll start with Lisa first and then go to Cyrus. Sure. Well, compassion fatigue, it has an interesting um, face, let's say, because sometimes people don't realize they have it. Uh, it can come about in forms of like being irritable, being agitated, frustrated, angry, um, feeling overwhelmed. It can also appear as depression, sadness, um, and just despair. So those are some some of the signs that you you may be experiencing compassion fatigue. Spires. And I, before we get too far along, I'd like to say I'm going to be controversial here, and say um, the term compassion fatigue I think is a misnomer. Uh, what we are what. What brings us to being feeling burned out is not so much compassion as it is empathy. Empathy is the ability to, to feel what the other being is feeling. And every one of us in the world of animal welfare and caring for the earth has empathy because that's what leads us to be in this job. But that empathy is, is coming this way. So we're feeling what the other is feeling. And we can sometimes get overwhelmed by that. We don't realize sometimes that it's coming from outside and we think this is how I feel and we get burned out. 
Compassion, on the other hand, is going out. Compassion is the wish for the suffering to end and sending good thoughts and feeling good things towards another being and wanting their suffering to stop and doing things to make that suffering stop. So compassion is what, what the work is. Empathy is how we connect with the other being. So I feel that we are being overwhelmed by that sense of empathy and what we're feeling from, from the other being. So not wanting to be too controversial, but I thought I would You can shake it up, Cyrus. You can shake it up. And you know what? You're not wrong. I don't think you're wrong in that. Um, <clears throat> I've been, I've been um, working in, in so many different fields for so very long and the, the terminology wasn't even there to begin with. Everybody um, you know, felt these things and there wasn't a name for them. And um, I think that yes, we're feeling compassion, we're feeling and reflecting with empathy. Um, and, and I'll add to a few more um, um, key um, things to look out for in yourself or in others. Um, in addition to the moodiness and depression, anger, Apathy is a big one as well. I think that those of us sometimes can just get so incredibly burnt out on one end of the spectrum that we almost become numb or apathetic and, and need to really take a step back. Um, uh, there, is, there can be a loss of faith um, or questioning of the faith and what am I doing here? What is really my purpose? Um, and then of course the self-medicating through a variety of things, whether it's alcohol or drugs and things like that to take note of. Um, in the years that I've been um, working in these different fields, I know that in animal caregiving now that we're a lot more educated and we can spot a lot of these, um, these behaviors and changes in behaviors in people. Um, although people can sometimes just keep, keep a lot of them to themselves or, or reflect on those things, reflect those ways when they get home. So um, it can be hard to see in even coworkers. But it's important, and I believe, especially in rescues and sheltering and advocacy, um, setting up um, different ways where people can help um, build the resiliency up um, ahead of time, whether that's in part with um, um, management, helping um, people along by making joint decisions as opposed to some. that they have in the tough decisions they may have to make, um, but being a part of it as opposed to just having to, to um, receive orders to do or go forward with, um, empowering people to speak up and things like that. Um, so I think we've come a, a, a very long way in the last 10, 15 years, um, whether we call it compassion fatigue or empathy fatigue. Um, my oh, next no. question is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I can answer <laughs> What are some of the ways you work to prevent or address compassion fatigue in yourselves, um, both in navigating how advocates treat each other or in self-care? Lisa? Oh, yeah. Well, I find a lot of solace in nature. So I like to um, spend time in nature each day, and it might be doing a physical activity like yoga, or I enjoy meditation as well, and finding a way to um, practice self-care so doing uh, having regular sleep and eating patterns all of those are really really helpful and taking little breaks during the day to be able to resume with um, a fresh mind uh, to different tasks that I might be doing um, a part of what I do is also helping other activists so um, at IDA, we have a lot of resources to help activists. So I don't know if this might be a good time to mention those, but let me know. Sure, sure. Okay, sure. So we have a support line that people can call. So they can literally pick up the phone and on the other end, there'll be a, a counselor who is trained in nonviolent communication and empathy tools to respond. Someone who cares, who really understands and gets the message, whether it's about animal activism or veganism, and so I'll share that number with you just in case anybody may want to call. It's 800-705-0419. Uh, and that line is actually 
um, staff 24-7. So anyone who's having a concern in the middle of the night, you've just seen a terrible image on Facebook or somewhere which just stuck with you, um, you, you're able to call and have somebody on the other line who, who really cares. And so that's, that's one of the wonderful services that we have. The idea was put together by um, Dr. Marilyn Kroplick, who's a psychiatrist who is the current president of In Defense of Animals. But she thought, how wonderful if we could have a mm -hmm. support line for animal activists. So we do. We have that. And uh, to go along with that, we have a Facebook page. I know some Facebook groups can be uh, areas where people uh, argue with each other, but this Facebook page that we have is really to promote um, compassion and kindness among animal activists, mm -hmm. and it's called the Animal Activist Online Support Group, and we have it moderated by uh, professional support line counselors and therapists, so um, if anything goes awry, we have uh, support staff there to monitor it, and people can share their feelings and get support. and. Um, camaraderie on that page and we also don't include any graphic images of any kind so that when people go to the page or to this group to, to chat they they find that um, what they see is going to be positive images or uplifting images about animals all so that information can be found on um, your website in defense of animals yes if they go to in defense of animals um, dot org forward slash sustainable activism that would be a good way to find it amongst the larger web page um, and so and on facebook you can find the group directly just by going to the uh, animal activist online support group and we also have a monthly support group that we've been running for years even before people knew about zoom <laughs> we were running these zoom groups and so uh, we have people from all around the world from africa uh, to australia to england and all across the united states that join us every month and we have a conversation we talk about what's on your heart what's on your mind what are some um some you know good news that you want to share or perhaps there's something that you're struggling with or concerns um, in your your own locality so people do share and we have a good heart-to-heart -heart talk every month so that's so also available do you think that um, because you're you've set the guidelines for um, we're all gonna we're all gonna be positive here and, and help lift each other up that that actually follows through on your your site oh yeah definitely we encourage one another um, I lead the support group every month and so each each one of these um, features that we offer, there, there's a support line counselor attached to it, someone who's trained, someone who can help mitigate if any other issues come up. And of course, you know, during the pandemic, we have had people with very diverse opinions in our groups, and we've been able to um, encourage a really safe place where people can respect one another's opinions and also continue to support each other. So it's been a really positive experience. And if anybody wants to join that group, that it's very simple. It's go to idausa.org and then forward slash support groups. If you do that, you'll get the registration. You can join us. It's on the fourth Thursday of every month. Thank you, Lisa. Cyrus, do you have um, um, something to add about the ways um, you, your work um, prevents and addresses compassion fatigue? I know you mentioned the meditation, which I think is very powerful. Yes, I think it's important. First of all, I, I love all the things Lisa has just described. That's really terrific resources for people. Uh, but I think the important thing for people in the um, compassion industry uh, is to realize that compassion starts with ourselves and how important self-care is. And so it's kind of ironic that people in the caregiving business don't want to take time off. They don't want to uh, take care of themselves because there's this animal that needs their help. It's very hard to break them out of that, uh, that rut of just caring for the animals and not caring for themselves. It's, it's habitual. And it's a thing that I think goes with the territory that because we are empathetic people and compassionate people that end up in this kind of work, we feel there's something that we typically feel is that we're not ever able to do enough. So I think recognizing that we have these feelings, that we have these compulsions that lead us to, to overwork ourselves, to not care about uh, taking care of us, to 
care more for the animals than we do for ourselves. We have these uh, habitual compulsions and to accept that and start there and start by taking care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. That's great. And, and I'll even add to that, um, and not being judgmental, whether it's for others or ourselves, um, we're all trying to do what we can do. And, and we, we all have a finite amount of energy, even if we're not willing to admit it. And so we need to, um, to build back that energy. And the only way we can do that is by taking the time to look at ourselves and whether it's through meditation or being in nature, um, taking vacations like regular people, <laughs> um, and understanding that the, the animals will be okay until we get back, or um, they'll be, be better off when we get back and not so depleted. Um, and so will our coworkers as well. Um, I've always said that we measure, um, you know, our successes and baby steps in animal welfare. Although I do feel, and I've said this before, that in the last 10 years or so, things have really ramped up and it's a really good time, I think, to be working towards animal um, causes and things like that. We, we're doing well. I, I believe that there's um, reason to be hopeful and reason for gratitude and practicing gratitude through um, through a variety of different things, whether it's just patting your coworkers on the back or lifting them up by saying, let me take that shift for you, or why don't we go play softball as a team to, you know, something that gets you out of just the animal world um, all of the time where we tend to roost and um, and, and focus on um, the, the things that will recharge us and make us better at our work the next day or the next week. Those are very vital things. Um, I, I, I also like to point out if we don't do those things, if we're the martyrs, as I like to think in, in a negative term as I used to be, if we're the martyrs, we don't, we don't, um, we, we're not doing ourselves any favor and ultimately we're, we're shortchanging the animals. So in that reframing of things, I think that um, when we take care of ourselves, we're taking care of the animals even better. And that's really ultimately what we're all called to do or wanting to do. So my last question for us is, there are many everyday people who are not animal rescuers or advocates who care about the treatment of animals and humans, but feel powerless or overwhelmed by the way things are out there. And they see them as being dark and unable to um, facilitate change. And so as a result, um, experience a form of compassion fatigue themselves by shutting down and doing nothing. I can't do anything, therefore, I can't facilitate change, therefore I won't do anything. What are your thoughts on how to help people who care but find it too painful or can't find their way to what they need to do? Lisa, wanna start? Sure, well this definitely comes up when people contact us for support. And one of the things that we put together is a series of tips from different um, people in the field. So I know we have Dr. Will Tuttle. Um, there have been several other people who've put together these little video tips. So if people go to that web page that I mentioned earlier, they can find a series. And some of, some of the advice that's been given is really to look at this as like a, a very large movement and that we're, we're part of it and that it's, um, it's going to succeed. It's going to take some time and that each each step that we're doing, each choice that we make can make a difference, um, but it all contributes. It's like a little drop in the ocean that all, but the ocean itself is large. <laughs> so we're really, we're really connected to this giant movement that's happening and this shift of consciousness, like really worldwide that's happening and that we're part of it. And to, to hold one another up, to really um, reach out to each other and there's a practice called community care where if you start to notice, oh, that person hasn't been at a protest in a while, or I haven't seen that person at, at any of our, our, our vegan or our, our potlucks or any events, to, to contact them, to reach out, to, to actually become friends with the people that we are, uh, that are our fellow activists, because that way we can, we can find out how they're doing. We can reach out and have conversations and really develop that network so that we can care for one another. I think that's so important for anyone who's feeling depleted or isolated. Um, and to know that they're not alone. They're not alone in this movement, but they're not alone in feeling those feelings either. And so having, having that network is really, really key if somebody's feeling down and out. And I, I also like to practice some things that are 
personal um, things you can do on your own that are almost um, almost like a spiritual practice. So if you are feeling upset about a particular animal who's suffering, a particular um, image that you've seen, is just to, to take a moment, almost have like an inner dialogue with that, that animal. And, and um, uh, it's really a practice of creating a new image of what, what happened instead of seeing that animal continually suffering and dying over and over in a loop to really imagine like, if what if that animal could be rescued? What if I could be there and help that animal? What if uh, you know a spiritual um, support came for that animal in that moment? And just imagining what that would be like for them. So finding ways that we can um, shift the the images that we're replaying in our minds, so that we can create that um, that new upwelling of of positive positive uh, visioning for the animals too. Yeah, it is a reframing, isn't it, of, um, of, of the possibilities and, um, and, and allowing us to move forward the next day or the next week. Yeah. How about you, Cyrus? <clears throat> so for everyday people who are looking to um, do something, I would say start with one thing. It's a big, you know, we are, we are involved in a huge task. It's changing society, really. We're not going to succeed at all of any of our goals in, in this world uh, until, for, for example, nobody would be able to say, oh, it's only an animal. Oh, it's only a dog. Oh, it's only a cow. It doesn't matter. When people can no longer say those things, then we're closer to success. And that is societal change. It's a change in consciousness. It's a huge job. So where do, how do we do that when we're here? How do we reach to that huge goal? We start with small things. Just break that huge goal into small pieces. Break whatever job we have to do into small pieces do that one thing first, and then go and do another thing. If that one thing, if you're not involved in animal welfare, if you don't work for one of these organizations, and you want to help, then like I said before, like several people have said, give a donation, adopt an animal, go visit them, volunteer, just one little thing at a time. And then, then you find, you become a part of this movement, Lisa was talking about. We are all together, doing this thing together. And the only way it's going to happen is by all of us working together. So do that one thing and then welcome aboard. <laughs> part of the yes, so I true. love that. I love it's that. So true. It reminds me of when um, people will um, ask, you know, they would love, or they would say they would love to be a vegan, but they can't give up cheese. And so our response would be, We'll give up everything but cheese then, <laughs> because you can make you can make a tremendous difference by you know by doing just simple things or thinking that you don't have a wall. You have to do it all. You don't have to do it all. I always say it doesn't have to come out of the gate a hundred percent. Making changes like you both describing are um, available to all of us every day. We could all do better. I always say. Um, we need to um, we need to set limits and boundaries. We don't all need to give 100% every single day, whether it's um, you know for people wanting to make that change to a diet or thinking that they um, they can't help um, because they don't have enough money to donate. Um, we all know that this movement um, of the societal change um, ha has been going on for you know as long as I've been around and longer than that, and and. Every single thing will move us forward if we all keep doing it. Um, if we all stop and say it's beyond us, it, nothing will ever change or, or move forward. Um, I, um, I, I think that everybody's on their own personal journey and not, not being judgmental, like going back to what I was um, originally saying about um, sometimes I believe that animal people can be their own worst enemies by um, calling out other activists for not doing it their way or the way they envision and 
Um, and I think that that's only detrimental in the end to the cause that we're all really trying to support. So getting on the same page, like what you're saying, Lisa, about the Facebook page, um, everybody's there and, and if, if you have something to say, you know, try, try and say it as kindly as possible. And um, we don't all have to agree, but we should have some kind of respect, I think, for the work that we're all trying to achieve um, out there. That's an important, uh, important thing. I always go back to old Aesop's, no act of kindness, no matter how small is ever wasted. And um, although we like everything to change overnight, we are all realists in knowing that um, that that's not going to happen. So give it give it whatever we can give it, whether it's a meatless Monday or um, giving up everything but cheese um, or, or, or anything else. And um, the people who aren't um, even involved with advocacy, but perhaps in, in different lights, the artists um, who are, who are you know, like you, Cyrus, and um, and people of Compassion Arts, I don't have an artistic bone in my body, so I can only imagine that the works that you're doing out there are no less than the work that, that you know, people are doing um, on site for, for animals. The, there are ways that we can all work for the cause. It just doesn't all have to be the same. Um, so I'm grateful to everything that both of you do and that all of you are doing at Compassion Arts. Thank you for being part of our little round table. And um, I'll move on to my few um, closing remarks about such a beautiful um, program that um, has been put together. I would like to thank all of our amazing guests, of course, both near and far. I am grateful for all of your work and your expertise and your immense heart and dedication and devotion for something that I'm so passionate about, um, animal causes and animal welfare and rights. A special and heartfelt thank you to all of our kind and generous viewers today um, who care and who can do better and who want to do better and who are just a part of the whole movement, just being um, uh, wanting to be informed and part of this um, festival this year. Um, most um, uh, next, I'd like to thank Lauren, our volunteer tech wizard who behind the scenes helps make everything run as smoothly as possible, not my my um, um, best um, suit with technology. Um, and um, again, no, last but not least, um, Compassion Arts um, advocate, um, activist and artist, Ellie Sardi, who's nothing less than an inspiration and power force for the animals. Um, thank you to her and this festival and including me as well. So um, everybody be well and take very good care. Thank you. Yeah.